Jeez, this is seriously a stubborn little screw. Like, how am I gonna get the animatic to work with? Oh, you're here. Now, like any other movie out there, you can distinguish which animated film is which by simply looking at the person who made it. Like, you can tell from your Ralph Bakshi's to your Don Bluth's. But what makes animation so unique than any other movie out there is that you can distinguish which one is which by the animation studio that made them. You know, you got your Disney's, you got your Pixar's, you got your DreamWorks, you got your Ghibli's, and so much more. But unfortunately for stop motion, there's not a lot of animation studios that specializes in that medium. But there is one. There is one animation studio out there that is not only well known for their stylized look, but also it's a very trusted studio. Known to make the finest quality entertainment out there using that special little medium. I am talking about, of course, of Ardman. It all started way back with a young David Sproxton at school who met a new student by the name of Peter Lord. They had been great friends since and have a lot in common, including a high interest in films and both their dads worked for the BBC. In their spare time, they liked to make little pieces of animation, which today can be found very similar to the Terry Gilliam cartoons in Monty Python's Flying Circus. Some of these cartoons can actually be dated all the way back to 1965. Anyways, these pieces actually got him a deal in Bristol to make some small cartoons for a show called Vision On in 1972. Their first job was some cell animations of a dumb superhero they named Ardman, which Peter and David decided to name their company after. The name Ardman was actually made when the two were kids, trying to figure out a word that has more A's than Aardvark. Now those were really tough times. Nowadays, any questions you have can be answered by a Google search away. But back then, you actually had to think and use your brain for moments like these. I really do sympathize for young Peter and David and their hardworking brains. Anyways, three years later, the boys got bored with making cell animation and decided to move on to something new that they could experiment, stop motion. So they decided to make a little short called Gleebies, where a bunch of clay characters mess around with some stuff on a desk. It was so successful when they used it on the show Take Heart, that they decided to make a fully clay character that has the same concept as the Gleebies named Morph a year later. The Morph segments became so popular and the fact that the guys would give them new characters to work with like Morph's brother Chaz, it eventually spun off its own series in 1980 called The Amazing Adventures of Morph. After that, the boys would go and hire five new animators to do little exercises with their animation. Their project is to make several shorts based on recordings they made of random people just having a conversation with another person. It's more of a nice way to practice their lip syncing work. This ended up working pretty well since they got a deal to show the shorts on Channel 4, so they went to hire three more animators to create a few more of these shorts, one of which being a young film student named Nick Park. While he was at Ardman, Nick was really a natural in animation. Of course, he got paid while doing this, but also in exchange for working on some of their shorts like More for Babylon, the guys at Ardman would help him finish school and work on some of his personal projects. But he truly shined at the company when he was in charge of a short in 1989 called Creature Comfort, where it shows a series of interviews of animals talking about their lives in the zoo, which ended up winning Ardman's first Oscar. But that wouldn't be Nick's crowning achievement of his career. That would start a bit after Creature Comfort when he released the first show that features two characters we all know as Wallace and Gromit. Now the idea of the two characters all started while Nick Park was in film school, thinking of random ideas for a children's book. One of which being a story where a man and his dog go to the moon. It was at that point Nick decided to use that as his subject for a short he wanted to make titled A Grand Day Out where Wallace and Grummet are on vacation, but all out of cheese.
So where can you find a place that's full of cheese? The moon, of course, since it's entirely made out of it. Bet they didn't tell you that on Cosmos. He began working on this in 1982, while practicing the movements of the characters with plasticine while he was at school. When making Gromit, he was supposed to be a cat, but for someone like Gromit, it's better off if he stays as a loyal dog. As for his name, Nick just likes the sound of the word grommets, which his brother often mentions. You couldn't stop me saying this word! Gromit this! Gromit that! The f is Gromit me! For Wallace, he was supposed to be a postman named Jerry, but Jerry and Gromit doesn't really sound good. But then when he was on a bus with an old lady with her big dog, she kept referring to it as Wallace. And it was at that point Nick found a name for Gromit's master. For Wallace's voice, Nick offered 50 pounds to actor Peter Salas, which surprisingly to Park, he accepted and did the voice. When he was offered to work at Ardman in 1985, he already did 10 minutes of his project, and like I mentioned before, Nick would work on some of Ardman's projects, like the dancing chicken scene in the music video Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel, in exchange for helping him on a grand day out. Originally, Nick wanted to do a lot more for the short. He wanted to make a 40-minute special that would include a parking meter attendant, a robot cook, aliens, a fast food joint on the moon, and a prison break scene. But then someone at Ardman gave him a reality check and told him that it would take him forever if he wanted to do all that. So what happened is that Nick scrapped everything except for the parking meter robot that would serve as the conflict for our two characters while on their moon vacation. The production would go on until it was finally done and premiered on Channel 4 on Christmas Eve 1990. It turned out to be a major hit since it was nominated for an Oscar for Best Animated Short, but lost to Creature Comfort. Well, on the bright side, Nick Park still got an Oscar. Afterwards, he got many different offers to work on several different projects, including commercials and movies, but Nick had better ideas in mind, which would go in his next Wallace and Gromit short, The Wrong Trousers, where Wallace brings in a new roommate in order to pay their rent. But what they didn't know is that this little penguin is actually a criminal mastermind. For this short, Nick wanted to do something that feels more like a movie, something that would have more action scenes like he originally wanted in A Grand Day Out. So with the help of writer Bob Baker, they managed to put together a story with all the sketches Nick had done beforehand. Since they only had two years to make this, Nick had to bring in another animator, Steve Box, to help him out on the animation, where Nick had to work on Wallace and Gromit, while Steve had to animate Feathers McGraw, which is the penguin, by the way. When it was released on December 26, 1993, it got a lot of praise from critics and it launched the global popularity of the duo. It even got tons of awards, including Wallace and Gromit's first Oscar. So there would be no surprise that immediately afterwards, Ardman would go and make another Wallace and Gromit short, this time called A Close Shave, where Wallace falls in love with a girl named Wendelin, but he has to also save Gromit from being falsely accused of being a sheep napper. If there is one word to describe the entire short, both as it is and in the production, it's more. More story, more characters, more action, more special effects, more romance, more people working on it even. Originally, the story would focus more on Wendelin's father, thinking that he was dead the whole time, but turned out to be kidnapped. But then they decided that the short would be more about the sheep and a robot dog rustling them for wool. This would be the first Wallace and Gromit short where they had to apply and remove stuff digitally, since many of the effects, like Gromit on an airplane, requires a miniature rig or using some special effects that they can't do on stop motion alone. When it was out on Christmas Eve 1995, the exact same thing happened as last time. It got major praise from everyone and got plenty of awards, including another Oscar. Since then, Wallace and Gromit became a worldwide phenomenon, with every short translated in over 20 languages and countries like the UK, the US, the rest of Europe, and especially Japan going crazy over the two. 
An interesting note to mention is that thanks to some clever marketing, the characters are actually responsible for saving the company that made Wallace's favorite cheese, Wensleydale. But moving forward in 2002, it has been a while since the two were on a major adventure, and Japanese broadcasters were demanding Ardman to do something new with them. The result came out in the form of Cracking Contraptions, a series of two to three minute cartoons showing many of Wallace's inventions. Today, you can go check them out on Ardman's YouTube channel. Now, of course, in 2005 saw the duo's big movie premiere with Curse of the Were-Rabbit, but I'm gonna save that for a little later. Two years after the movie, Ardman announced that they would return with yet another short, this time called A Matter of Loaf and Death, where Wallace falls in love with a woman in an old bread ad while a killer is on the loose axing off bakers. This short went on record for the fastest production in a Wallace and Gromit short, where they started working on January 2008 and finished in October of that same year. When it came out in the UK on Christmas Day 2008, it was the most watched UK program of that year. It got critical acclaim as usual, and it was only nominated for an Oscar, since it lost to Logorama. But the short did win a BAFTA and an Annie. From then on, Wallace and Gromit appeared in many other places, more than just movies and shorts. They appeared in museums, including the Ghibli Museum in Tokyo, Japan, since animation legend Hayao Miyazaki is also a fan of the characters, a live orchestra show called Musical Marvels that started in the Royal Albert Hall in July 2012, then went on tour, a spin-off show called Shaun the Sheep from A Close Shave, which that got a spin-off show called Timmy Time, created charities after them like Wallace and Gromit's Children's Foundation, and even made an entire ride at Pleasure Beach Blackpool in Lanchester, England called Wallace and Gromit the thrill o -matic, where it depicts all of their adventures from a grand day out to a matter of loaf and death. And these are just a few examples of what the characters have done in recent years. Today, Wallace and Gromit have not only become some of the most renowned characters in animation, but also true icons of British animation. Now at this point, I would go and talk about how Ardman entered the world of cinema with movies such as Chicken Run and Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. However, there's just one little problem with that. You see, if you guys don't remember, I already talked about those films years ago when I talked about animation look back, DreamWorks Animation. Now, I don't want to reuse the same old material because that would just seem lazy, but, for the sake of this, I can summarize what happened. Plus, I could talk about some extra little facts that I didn't mention before. In 1995, Peter Lord and Nick Park decided to go and make a feature film. They thought about doing one of Wallace and Gromit, but Nick felt that he's not ready to move the duo to the big screen, and instead make an original escape film with chickens called Chicken Run. In 1996, Arnman managed to make a deal with Pate, helping them finance the film while they distribute in Europe. A year later, DreamWorks Animation came on board in order to distribute the film everywhere else in the world. Why DreamWorks? Well, they were a new company back then, and they were looking for ways to compete against the mouse. Anyways, when the film was released on June 23, 2000, the movie was a huge success both critically and financially, earning about $225 million worldwide, as well as getting plenty of awards. However, even if it didn't get nominated at the Oscars, the movie was popular amongst the members of the Academy, and they decided for next year to create a new category known as Best Animated Feature. Now, what Chicken Run means to Ardman is more of an exercise to fully understand how to make a feature-length film. But now that they finally got that knowledge, Nick Park feels ready to make a Wallace and Gromit movie, known as Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Originally, Wendelin from A Close Shave was supposed to be in the film with Wallace as her gardener. But as production moved on, she was replaced with an original character, Lady Toddington. 
However, even if they were armed with the experience of Chicken Run, there were still some obstacles they had to go through during production. There were a lot of technical aspects that proved very challenging for stop motion like fur, and if that wasn't enough, they always had DreamWorks on their backs demanding changes and requests on the story, the script, and many more. But then when it was out on October 7th, 2005, like the shorts, it was a major hit. It earned a lot of praise from critics, earned about $192.6 million at the box office, and won tons of awards, including an Oscar for Best Animated Feature. Okay, so now that those two films are out of the way, let's continue our story. After the release of Curse of the Were-Rabbit, there was a fire that occurred in the storage facility, which unfortunately destroyed many of the models, props, scenes, and awards it won over the years. However, the people at Ardman are still keeping a positive attitude and moving forward. As Nick Park says, even though it's a precious and nostalgic collection and valuable to the company, in light of other tragedies like the earthquakes and tsunamis, today isn't a big deal. In 2006, Ardman released their first fully computer-animated film, Flushed Away. The reason why Ardman brought in computers is mostly to get more with the times, since many animated films nowadays are all CG instead of other mediums like hand-drawn and stop-motion. That, and also to give them more options to work on with their commercials and other projects. Like Chicken Run, where the team learned how to make movies while simultaneously making it, the guys at Ardman learned how to work on a CGI film while making Flushed Away. On its release, it wasn't as successful as Curse of the Were-Rabbit, but still pretty good. It still got positive reviews and managed to get $178 million at the box office. But considering the movie has a $149 million budget, they made DreamWorks lose a big chunk of money. As a result, along with the reasons of creative differences, Ardman and DreamWorks decided to part ways. There was supposed to be another film they would have made for the American company called Crude Awakening, which was about cavemen and it was based on Roald Dahl's The Twits, with John Cleese co-writing the film. But when the two split, DreamWorks ended up keeping the rights. Today, this project has turned into what we all know now as the Crudes. In 2007, Ardman went on to find themselves a new distributor to present their films around the world. This time is Sony Pictures Entertainment, in a deal to distribute their animated features under the Sony Pictures Animation name. But while they were making the films, there were a few projects they had to make along the way, including A Matter of Loaf and Death, Shaun the Sheep, and several short films on the Flipnote Studios app on the Nintendo DSi. It wasn't until 2011 they released their next computer animated film, Arthur Christmas, which was a collaborative work of Ardman and Sony Pictures Imageworks. It was praised by critics saying that Ardman Animations broadened their humor a bit for Arthur Christmas, a clever and earnest holiday film with surprising emotional strength. But it didn't really do well at the box office, only earning $147 million. But then their next film came in, one that would bring them back to their stop-motion glory and Peter Lord as the man in charge. That movie was The Pirates in an Adventure with Scientists, based on the book of the same name by Gideon Defoe. It's about a pirate captain named The Pirate Captain, how original, who dreams of being Pirate of the Year. But there's just one problem. He's kind of a pretty crappy pirate and he has really tough competition. That would make an amazing movie, but no. Anyways, with the help of his crew and even Charles Darwin, the captain goes out to win that title by stealing Queen Victoria's treasure. For those of you who live outside of the UK, you might recognize this movie more by its international title, The Pirates, Band of Misfits. So why didn't everyone else get in an adventure with scientists? Well, even if Peter Lord said that the title doesn't seem that appealing to the US, several theories have been spreading around about why. All of which regarding about the Americans. Some say that the title was way too long for them. Some say that it was more for the creationists that hate the theory of evolution. 
Even Quentin Cooper of the BBC thought that it could be because the word scientist is just not a word for Hollywood that sounds cool. So a more better solution would be to replace it with the Band of Misfits? Yes, yes, I, I'm using crew in the street sense. You. Another change they did, this time just in the US, is replace a few actors. Russell Tovey, who played the albino pirate, got switched with Anton Yelchin, and Ben Whitehead, who played the pirate who likes sunsets and kittens, yep, that's what they actually called him, is replaced with the Today Show's Al Rooker. Although this is more of a stop-motion film, there was a lot of CGI used in the movie, namely for the sea and the backgrounds. In many behind-the-scenes footage like this one, you can see that most of the time, they have to shoot it behind a green screen. The people at Aardman spent a total of 18 months to film the entire movie by shooting 40 scenes simultaneously and capturing about 1 to 4 seconds daily. Just before its release, the movie was already getting itself into controversy because of this scene in the trailer. Afraid we don't have any gold, old man. This is a leper boat. <laughs> See? The officials at the World Health Organization and the Lepra Health in Action got really offended and even said that it reinforces the misconceptions which lead to stigma and discrimination that prevents people from coming forward for treatment. What happened was that the people at Ardman did realize that the joke was a bit of poor taste. So they made an apology and replaced that clip with this one for the theatrical release. This is a plague boat, old man. I'd give my right arm for some gold. <laughs> or my left. <laughs> when it was released on March 28, 2012, then April 27th in North America, it actually did pretty well. Critics like me gave it more positive reviews, saying that the Pirates is pretty much Pirates of the Caribbean for kids. It may not be as good as Ardman's past films, but it's still really enjoyable with good humor, great use of animation, and characters that are over the top and lovable. As for the box office, it didn't really do much with just $123 million. But it did get nominated for several Annies and an Oscar for Best Animated Feature. Peter Lord did have some ideas for a sequel, but because the movie didn't get as much money as they hoped for in the US, the plans for a sequel are most likely scrapped. What they did do, however, is create a special short made for the DVD and Blu-ray called So You Want to Be a Pirate, where the captain hosts a talk show explaining the audience about becoming a true pirate like him. Although that Ardman does have some plans to do some feature films in the future, Today they are settling down with some more smaller projects that would have that special Ardman touch. Rather they be for TV shows, commercials, or YouTube videos that would bring back the magic of their roots with more.